Okay. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Laura Kepley, Artistic Director of Cleveland Playhouse and a proud member of the City Club. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, award-winning playwright and 2018 MacArthur Fellow, Dominique Moriso. Ms. Moriso, Ms. Moriso is one of the most widely produced writers in the United States. Her works portray the lives and individuals of, and communities grappling with economic and social changes, both current and historical. A powerful storyteller, Ms. Moriso's examination of character and circumstance is a call for audiences to consider the actions and responsibilities of society more broadly. Three of her plays will be produced by Cleveland Theaters this season. Wow. Skeleton, Skeleton Crew, about the auto industry and workers' rights in Detroit, will be presented at Dobama Theater starting in January. Paradise Blue, dramatizing Detroit's jazz community in 1949 before gentrification altered the landscape, is currently showing at Caramu House. And Pipeline, taking on the school-to-prison pipeline and a mother's struggle to protect her son's future, begins performances at Cleveland Playhouse this weekend. Today, through the lens of these topical and timely works of art, Ms. Mariso will discuss the importance and impact of art as a tool for social change. A Detroit native, Ms. Mariso's performance career started young. She acted in plays at her father's church, danced in her aunt's troupe, the Detroit City Dance Company, and starred in musicals throughout high school. She studied at the University of Michigan, earning a BFA, and originally made a name for herself as a performance poet. In addition to her playwriting, she is a co-producer on the Showtime series, Shameless, and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and re recently made her Broadway debut, penning the book behind the Tony-nominated musical, Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Mariso will be in conversation with Daniel Gray Kantar, the Executive Artistic Director at 12 Literary Arts, a nonprofit organization dedicated to intergenerational performance and dialogue. He is a poet, teacher, youth mentor, rapper, journalist, and education activist. In, his addi in addition to his role at 12, arts, 12 Literary Arts, Mr. Gray Kantar is an education consultant for the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He is the former chair of the Literary Arts Department at Cleveland School of the Arts and a former graduate school fellow at UC Berkeley's College of Education. Esteemed guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dominique Moriso and Daniel Gray Contar. <laughs> Hey. Hey. <laughs> 
<laughs> that starred in High School Musical was a little bit of a stretch. Oh, I know. <laughs> was in them. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, welcome to Cleveland. <laughs> Thank you. So I understand uh, that the last playwright um, to be here in this forum, um, who also had a play cycle, uh, was August Wilson. <laughs> you um, are the first person since August Wilson to be here in this way. And also That's to have cool. the three play cycle performed here at the same time. Yeah. Um, how does that feel? It feels like, thanks August, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I write in, in the tradition of August and many other writers. He's yeah. one of many, uh, but that feels pretty cool, yeah. yeah. So I wanna uh, start by, they say begin at the beginning. So I, you know, we talked a little bit in the introduction about uh, about your work as a poet and mm -hmm. also how you started in high school as an actress. Can you tell me a little bit though about, um, about Detroit and how Detroit informed um, your capacity for storytelling? You know, I th uh, because there are so many artists that come out of the city of Detroit, you mm -hmm. know, I, one of the other writers that I write in the tradition of, I say, is um, Pearl Clegg, who's mm -hmm. um, a novelist, uh, essayist, a playwright, and I read poet. I've read Pearl's work um, growing up. Her father, Reverend Albert Clegg, was a, a started the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Detroit. Yes. So she, you know, so she has a her capacity for storytelling comes from that, mm -hmm. and I see myself in her work, and um, and so through her, through um, other artists and writers in the city. Um, I think that I've been, you know, I, I just, I've had it all around me. And my mother was the kind of mom, she's a teacher. My mother, I dedicate Pipeline to my mother um, because she was a teacher for 40 years in Highland Park, which is a sub city inside of Detroit. I don't, it's not a suburb, you know, I call it a sub city. Mm -hmm. It's surrounded all, on all sides by Detroit like a water. And, um, and it is one of the most, um, I think, economically stressed cities in our country. You know, and legitimately, Highland Park has been like third world city, um, uh, uh, part in part due to the way the state of Michigan treats Highland Park. But well, we could talk about that another time. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, and so because my mother served that, she's the kind of mother who cares about education, you know, um, who cares about uh, opening me up to all of the things that I might have an inclination for. So if I sort of thought I wanted to draw, my mama got me a drawing book, you know? Mm -hmm. If I wanted to dance, mama put me in dance class. If I wanted to play tennis, that was very short-lived. I had to, be on, <laughs> had to be on the tennis team. And, you know, and if I wanted to write, my mother read to me uh, when I was a child and got me very in, the way she read, it just really got me into writing and reading um, poetry and everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of grew up in the Detroit poetry scene. Mm. And in fact, I say that the Detroit poets taught me about my history. Mm. You know, writers teach you uh, things. And doing poetry in Detroit, um, I, there's a poet, his name was Paradise. Mm. He called himself Paradise. Mm. He was doing poems about Paradise Valley. That's how I first learned the Paradise Valley. Wow. And, uh, and to write Paradise Blue, which is about Paradise Valley, it started with education from other writers talking about their city. Um, and so Detroit has this way, writers from Detroit in, in general have this way of taking ownership of the city. We were talking last night, the cast of Pipeline and I and the crew were talking about um, the fact that Detroit is one of those cities that knows its political history. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm also Haitian. And um, Haiti is another, it's a country where everybody knows their political history, like everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you're visiting, like Conan O'Brien, I don't know if this went viral at one point, but Conan O'Brien, who I know and is a great, cool dude, you know, Conan went to, um, to Haiti and there's a video where he's talking to these Haitian children. And the one girl, she's speaking in Creole, but they put her subtitles. And she's saying to Conan, you know, the kids are like shaking Conan's hand. And she's like, no, 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 no. You know, he, oh, he owes us. They're going to come here and they're going to try to take over our land. 
<laughs> and Conan's like, hey, I don't want it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, t- I'm not trying to take anything for you. She's like, that's okay. That's okay. You know, she's like, but still, you still owe us. You still owe us. <laughs> <laughs> for things that you have taken from us. And I, you know, she's like, six. <laughs> and I, you're like, what's happening? What does she know? And the other kids are like, oh, yeah, we forgot about that. You know? And, um, <laughs> you know, and I think that that's also sort of how Detroit is. It's a, it's a, basically, it's a city of people that know that we know where we stand in juxtaposition to the rest of the rest of the state of Michigan around us, you know, um, and and so we talk about ourselves. We sort of take the we take control of our narrative where we can, mm-hmm. and that was my interest in telling stories about Detroit. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like, first of all, you had a good mama, mm-hmm. um, but it also sounds like it is just kind of embedded within the context of the artist community in Detroit um, to share story and to share story about Detroit. You mentioned um, a poet paradise and I want to ask you, Detroit's literary history, particularly its black arts literary history, is thick Mm -hmm. and strong. Writers like Robert Hayden, Mm -hmm. uh, Dudley Randall, Mm -hmm. uh, so many others really Mm -hmm. formed a foundation Mm -hmm. um, for the black literary arts. So I guess my question is, how do you see yourself, how do you see your work fitting within that tradition um, that black writers um, have started in the, as far back as the 40s? Yeah. I'm a granddaughter of the black arts movement and, and the mm. black liberation movement, right? So it's not my generation. It's not necessarily my mother's. It's sort of my mother's, but it's also my grandmother's, you know? And so I consider myself a daughter slash granddaughter of that generation of that movement, which means I grew up reading poets. I grew up reading Dudley Randall, Broadside Press, which is talked about in my play Pipeline. Um, But Broadside Press was a a black publishing company started in Detroit that was giving voice uh, and publication to black writers that weren't getting picked up by Random House, you know? And so um, I grew up reading uh, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni because of Broadside Press. The other thing that I think is really interesting uh, about that is, so there's this book called The Black Poets that is um, uh, uh, edited by Dudley Randall, mm-hmm. and it has just like uh, Langston Hughes, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, I mean, it just has a, like a gamut of black writers. And um, I really loved poetry growing up, and I loved poetry. I was a big Shel Silverstein fan, still am. <laughs> um, that dude, I just love his stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and um, but when I, but I also grew up on like Maya Angelou, you know, and Nikki Giovanni. And one, in first grade, um, there was an essay contest. This is, my, this is sort of my push for books, like why books are so important. So one day I was cleaning and I found this, the book, The Black Poets, you know. Um, and I was like, what? So I look back, I remember this moment when one time I was uh, in the first grade, there was a Martin Luther King Jr. essay contest. You know, and you know, we all submitted a, a essay. And then we were all the students, K through eight, we were in the gymnasium at my school and they were gonna announce the winners. And I sat in that gymnasium, sort of like today, like looking around at all those students, and I was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna win. Like the odds are just too high. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, there's a lot of kids in this gym. It didn't do, I didn't do the math that it was per grade, so it wasn't, the, the odds weren't that high. <laughs> you know? But it just felt like, look at all these kids, there's no way I'm gonna win, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then they called my name for the first grade, and I won, mm. right? And the book that I got was The Black Poets. Mm. By Dudley Randall. So when I was cleaning one day, I found that book. I found, I opened the inscription that says, Dominique Marisa, Martin Luther King Jr. Essay Contest winner. And that book is a mark to me of like beating the odds, right? <laughs> like you can, you can feel defeated, you know, but like you have the chance to actually beat the odds. And so um, to me, that is an example of where I see myself in the tradition of like the black arts movement and black writers in Detroit. Like mm. we're writing to beat the odds. Yeah. You know. Black Poets is that foundational book that every poet who is starting out that is a black poet should read mm-hmm. first and foremost. Absolutely. That is the first one. Agreed. I tell my students that all the time. So I, I want to ask you about then, um, what is it that's happening uh, in Detroit right now? Can you give us kind of a state of what's happening in Detroit that might be informing your work um, in this moment? 
Uh, well, funny enough, I just came back from Detroit. I was there uh, a couple of weeks ago. They have this thing called Detroit Homecoming, where expatriates uh, come back home and we are learning about the city as investors. You know, they take us on real estate tours and take us, you know, uh, we meet, you know, have lunches like this or dinners with the mayor and, you know, and we're learning about where the investment opportunities are in Detroit. Um, so, in, ironically, my pay, play Paradise Blue, which is about gentrification in Detroit, this, that play is, it takes place in 1949 because it's about the jazz community but it might be my most contemporary play about Detroit mm. um, because that is exactly where the, they're at an apex of that again. You know, it's like it's either going to be developed or gentrified and it will always lean toward, toward gentrification. My way, I make a distinction between gentrification and development. I don't think they're the same thing. I think people mm. try to say they are, mm -hmm. but um, one is displacement and one is building with and not on top of, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I believe in development, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, people go, well, you gotta have gentrification. Some of it's good, right? No, none of it's good. Development is good. Displacement's never good. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so for me, the, the, my relationship with my work in Detroit and what it means now is, is just we are sort of seeing, just like in the country at large, you know, we're seeing some repeats, <laughs> some three-peats of history, you know, um, and, and sort of moving back to move forward. And I think that this is sort of a big questionable time in Detroit of like who's going to get a chance to have a stake in the city's future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sounds is, familiar. Yeah, I know it sounds real familiar. <laughs> really familiar. I mean, you know, you could kind of take that plug all around the country because I live in California now. That's what's happening in Inglewood. I, you know, New York, I've seen it happen in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. It's like unrecognizable to me right now, you know, from when I first moved out there 15 years ago. So, you know, 15 years is fast. That's fast for some, that's fast to change an entire community, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But I think that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's about connecting and finding out where to, how to be a part of a city's future and how to not allow for the railroading of people, you know, um, shipping, the shipping out of people. And I think that the artists have an opportunity to get in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the plays in the three play cycle. Um, but first, um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the actresses and directors who may be in the room uh, that are performing in all three of the pieces. Um, would you please stand to be acknowledged by this audience if you are... If any of you in this room have not seen um, Paradise Blue at Caramu Theater, please uh, absolutely do so. It is phenomenal. Um, and everything else that's uh, coming up. Um, so I want to ask you, how are these three plays in the three play cycle? How are they in conversation? So obviously with um, August Wilson um, in his cycle, they tackled decades. Mm -hmm. um, and they tackled. Um, they related to contemporary uh, Pittsburgh, but also, of course, looked at the history of Pittsburgh through the, through the plays. Um, how are your three pay, plays in conversation with each other? Well, first I'll say Pipeline is my play that is outside of the Detroit cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Detroit cycle consists of my play Detroit 67, which was also directed by Justin Emeka at Caramu um, a few years ago, like 2016, something like that. 16 maybe, I think, 2016. Um, so that includes Detroit 67, which is about the, uh, what Detroit calls the um, rebellion, the political uprising that happened in Detroit in 67. Uh, Paradise Blue, which is set in 1949 about the jazz community that was gentrified. Um, uh, and Skeleton Crew, which is coming up at Obama, which is about the auto industry in Detroit. That's right. uh, Pipeline, I, people don't know this, Pipeline is sort of set not in a specific uh, city, but has the, it is written in the tradition of like the vocal tradition of like New York, the New York education world, you know? Um, and, but it is actually inspired by events that happened in Detroit for me. So, you know, so Pipeline, even though it's not a part of the cycle, it is a part of the conversation at large of my work, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, and and you know, I guess the thread. I mean, I don't I don't really know the threads. I was listening to them, like, oh, that sounds interesting. I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I was, somebody once said to me, and this is like for earlier work that I don't even I haven't even produced, and it's not gonna see the light of day if I can help it. But it was um, <laughs> it was uh, I remember talking to somebody about my work one time, and they were, it, I was explaining to them, you know, just the subject matter, and they were like, oh, do you always write political plays? And I was like, political plays. <laughs> you know, and I had to think about what did I just say? What did I just tell this woman? You know, I said I was talking about a play about an abortion clinic, a protest at an abortion clinic <laughs> in Detroit. Again, not going to see the light of day. Um, <laughs> uh, a play about a protest that happened at the University of Michigan. It was a one act. Maybe you'll see it. Uh, one act. Um, and I think it was something else. I think I was talking about. Maybe my aunt's play. This will. This has seen the light of day. Uh, my aunt. A play about my aunt who was a madam in Mississippi and who used her brothel to help a civil rights activists and uh, create bail funds and harbor civil rights activists. Um, and so after saying those three things, you know, she said political and I was like, huh? <laughs> I had not thought of myself as a political writer. I, I, I own that moniker now, but I didn't at the time because I wasn't, I wasn't writing about politics. I was writing about people. I think people forget that politics affects people. That's right. So it's about the people always, That's you know? Right. And these are issues that just impact people and people kind of get on stages or they get on mics or they get in television or get in offices, you know? And they talk about these issues and pop, like they're not human beings at the center piece of them. Um, and so for me with these works, it's just about remembering, you know, when it comes to education, you know, I taught for, uh, many years. I've taught for about 20 years. Like I said, my mother taught for 40 before she retired. I taught at her school one year, uh, my first year out of college. And education is super important to me. When I was reading Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and it was talking about mass incarceration, um, I thought, oh, there's a whole nother Jim Crow that's happening in education, not just with the school to prison pipeline, but that is a big part of mass incarceration. But just also uh, segregation and lack of justice amongst educational institutions, you know. So that some students, you know, we have like a public private charter debate going on right now that is literally looking at kids who go to public school like they're gonna get an inferior education, and that's super problematic. And it's not even true, but that's a whole nother conversation as well. Um, it's not necessarily true, I should say. Um, but I think that that means that we are looking at um, have and have nots when it comes to education. And it's get, that gap is huge mm -hmm. and super problematic. Uh, so that for me is, is pipeline. Um, I think it's ironically with GM and the strike that's happening right now, I'm like, oh my God, you know, Skeleton Crew just, again, mm -hmm. it become, the plays that I write, they become important even when I think I'm writing about the past. You know, they become the most contemporary story. And I think that that says more about society than it does about me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd, I want to ask you, you know, um, one of our foremost literary heroes is James Baldwin. Yeah. And um, Baldwin says that the role of the writer within the context of social justice um, is to be a witness. Um, it is our responsibility as writers to first and foremost be witnesses uh, to what it is that we are experiencing mm -hmm. in this life. Uh, that's a bold statement and very true. What do you see uh, your role as being um, within the context of social justice? You mentioned that you're not, you didn't perceive yourself as a political writer. How do you see your writing as fitting within uh, the context of social justice witnessing? Does uh, that question make sense? Yeah, it does, absolutely. I think, you know, so I do think that artist's work can cause you to bear witness, right? I think that it can remind us of our collective humanity. I think, you know, um, for me, it was very important for me in, in telling stories about Detroit, for particularly. It was important to me to um, uh, humanize the city. You know, I think when I would tell people that I was from Detroit and when I go somewhere else, you know, and I say I'm from Detroit, and they talk about me like I, I said, you know, I just got shot five times, you know what I mean? Like, oh, a 
are you okay? How's it doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, or I'd be like, you know, like, oh, ooh, that's kind of hard, huh? You know, and I'm like, you, you know, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> but I also, you know, I, I remember one time teaching a bunch of students, and um, and I said this to them. I said, you know, when somebody talks about where you're from, who are they talking about? And unanimously, the class of uh, high school seniors, like, they talking about you. And I was like, whoa, that kind of cut me to the, to the white meat a little bit. Because I, I remember one time my husband, I, I tell this story every now and again, um, because it's even relative to, I told it to my cast on Broadway when we were talking about, uh, you know, doing the story of the Temptations on Broadway. I said, you know, we have a big old Detroit banner that comes on the set at some times. You know, it's a very Detroit story. On, I'm not going to let people forget that the Temptations come from Detroit. <laughs> you know? And, and, and um, you should. You know, and, and, but I remember one time my husband and I, we went to Michigan together. And um, at this time, this was at that time when Michigan was being sued for affirmative action because a white student claimed that a black student took her spot because there's that belief that there are also spots that were allocated for her somehow. And, um, and so what happened during that climate at Michigan was that there was tension, you know, there was a lot of tension in classes and you were maybe the only black student in your all white class, right? So that's what happened to my husband in his um, communications class. And they were looking at the effects of media you know, on our minds and our psyche. And his teacher, his professor, and he, he's like, you know, and mostly if you're like one of the only black people in your class, you're likely from Detroit, possibly, you know? Um, and so what happened is the teacher pulled up the city of Detroit and was trying and asked the class, you know, when you think of Detroit, like what comes to your mind, you know? And the class started shouting adjectives out mm. across the room, you know? You could just imagine, I'm guessing, what maybe some of those adjectives were, right? So you can hear violent, mm -hmm. dangerous, mm -hmm. dirty. Mm -hmm. And if those weren't bad enough, you know, um, then somebody shouted out degenerate. Mm -hmm. And my husband, at the time boyfriend, came back to me, you know, and approached me. Uh, and oh, I got told the story a thousand times, it still cuts me. And um, he came to me and told me what they said about him in class. And, and we just both like got emotional and like, you know, like what the hell? Like what do they think we're doing in this, like eating our young? Like what do they think right. we are doing there? I'm like, you talking about Detroit, you talking about my grandmother, who if you come over our house, she doesn't have to know you. She's gonna find something for you to eat, even if you're not hungry and you've told her several times. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And she, I mean, these are people that were like, I, I got in a car accident. There's a, in Skeleton Crew, there's a story about a car accident. I was in that car accident, and people on the road stopped for me, saved my life, pulled me out of the car, me and my, my, my best friend at the age of 16. Like, these are, these are some of the salt of the earth people. Who's talking about them like this? Who's been telling this lie about who we are, you know? And, um, and I felt like the, the media is being the only narrator about the city and they telling a very one-sided, lopsided narrative about who we are. And the Detroit writers and lovers need to step up and own the narrative of our city. And so that is part of why I tell the stories that I tell. And that's not just Detroit. That's, right. that's you know, that's Cleveland. That's right. That's Baltimore. That's, right. that's Chicago. That's Oakland. That's Atlanta. You know, the, these are the cities and, and many more. I mean, the, that, that's middle America. The, there are the places that we have written people off about who, what their true humanity is. And I feel that we have to own those narratives again and remind us that we are a lot more um, connected than we are divided about that kind of stuff. We are, our, our baseline of humanity is what keeps our blood going in this nation. You know, I'm reading Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States. Oh. And um, I recommend rereading for people who <laughs> have maybe already read. And if you haven't, please read this. But it will, like, when you read that book and you see, like, all of the divisions of class and all the, 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 the way this country was built to divide us mm -hmm. from our core baseline, if we knew what we were really connected by, we would, we would see a lot of uh, different action happening in this country. And I think this separation, this belief in our own ideas of superiority, whatever they are, 
could be they racial, economic, gender, privilege, whatever it is, you know, that if we could find that that was all a lie and a myth, you know, just like the lie of the degenerate Detroit, I think that we would, you know, really see uh, the needle move forward a lot swifter in this nation. And that's the job of the artist. The artist can help us expedite that conversation. So thank you for early church Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you asked the question, uh, what are we doing uh, to our children in Detroit? I would submit that through your work, you are doing the work of teaching, uh, raising the next generation of revolutionaries, raising the next generation of writers, and raising the next generation of teachers. Uh, my name is Daniel Gray Kantar. I'm the Executive Artistic Director at 12 Literary Arts. And today I'm talking with playwright in 2018, MacArthur Fellow, Dominique Morisot. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, where I'm sure some people will have some questions about that shameless thing. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't in the script. <laughs> Okay, go off. Let me rewind. Go off. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. <laughs> we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it uh, into our program. Holding the microphones today are Office and Customer Experience Coordinator Tiffany France and Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Uh, yes, with all that's going on now, are you inspired to perhaps do a piece on immigrant struggles? Um, I'm working on a play about Haiti right now. Uh, I've, I've visited, my father is from Haiti, he's from Port-au-Prince, and um, I visited Haiti in 2014 uh, before the civic unrest that's happening there right now that is not really being talked about much in the media, but like every other, like, like every other place really, um, Haiti is having a resistance to the leadership and the government, and they're having like in the street rebellion. Um, it is a, it is chaos, and it is anger, and it is frustration, and it is very, um, to me, reminiscent of like the resistance that you know I've seen all across the globe, but in apartheid Africa, in South Africa, and you know the, what we just saw in Puerto Rico with the hitting the streets to get rid of their governor, you know. And um, I think that it's we're in a space right now where Haiti is calling for the removal of the president, and um, and we will see how the international community, mm. who has had some dirty hands in Haiti and how they will respond, you know, um, how they will respond to what's happening. We've already gotten some words of how the uh, U.S. plans to respond, which is, I think, unsurprising. But it is, um, uh, yeah, I'm working, I'm, I'm actually writing about my time in Haiti in 2014, which was um, post-earthquake devastation and um, with the heavy presence of NGOs and how the Haitians responded to that. All right. Hi there. Hi. Hi, my name is Sydney Edwards, and I'm an actress here in Cleveland. Very cool. I'm originally from North Carolina. I always mention that. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, I, I love all of your plays, but I know you act too, and I was wondering if that's something you still do or want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do still act. I mean, I consider, you know, yeah, thank you for asking that because people try to talk about me like I was an actor. Thank you. I am not a was. <laughs> I am an actor. You try to do one new thing and people forget all your other things. You know? <laughs> and I remember when I was an actor, nobody took me seriously as a writer. I mean, it's like, you know, unless my name is Lynn Manuel Miranda, I can't do more than one thing at the same time. I also used to teach with Lynn Manuel Miranda. We're friends. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, you know, I do act. And funny enough, in Paradise Blue last year at Signature, my actress, Simone Mystic, who is uh, right now stars on a new show on CBS called All Rise. Um, but she is my Detroit sister, and she played Silver in Paradise Blue last year at, at, at Signature in New York City, and she couldn't do a show, and I had to go on for her. 
Oh. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> understudying, and I know I've got some understudies in the room right now. Understudying is hard work. <laughs> Big ups to the understudies. <laughs> Johnson. I'm a member of the Ohio Board of Education, and um, I love that your mom taught 40 years. I taught 40 years in Cleveland, so that was, I could really relate to that. Uh, the national movement to uh, dismantle our public schools is alive and well in Ohio, and uh, for example, there are something called vouchers, where children are allowed to leave public schools, take public dollars to go to religious and private schools, and just this year, our legislature changed the rule where students who get vouchers must attend public schools. They changed the rule to say that any student in that district could attend uh, religious or private schools, which is devastating our school districts. Uh, for example, Cleveland Heights went from zero vouchers to 400 mm. in one year, mm. and they did not budget for it. And Ohio has frozen money for public schools this year. My question to you is, with all of this going on, with the dismantling of public schools and understanding how much you care about education, any possibility of you writing something about this horrible, horrible movement? Well, you know, the, I mean, I think that that's in conversation with my play Pipeline, actually. Okay. Um, and I, 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 what I, my hope is for that play and for how it's curated, you know, is that it, it does, that we get community experts and, and education activists in the room together to be able to talk to audiences about the disparity in education. I think that, you know, one of the things, I worked for many years in New York City uh, for Creative Arts Team, which is an educational theater company that's in residence at City University of New York. And it is maybe, the, you know, it's a social justice theater company that we would go out into the schools and the public schools and we would teach a social issue. I worked for a long time in HIV AIDS prevention for teenagers. I talked to a lot of teenagers about a lot of sex. <laughs> they don't know a lot as much as we think. Um, and, and, but what that meant was also that part, and part of the educational program, we, taught, we did cultural harassment. We did so many things that are so relevant right now. And part, and part of that journey with City University of New York, we saw funding dry up for that program. We saw a lot of metrics have to be used that can't possibly, that, that don't work in education, like, like paperwork metrics that you can't see what's happening in a classroom. You can't possibly measure the impact of the work that way. And, and one of the things that we did with that was we, we ended up using that art, that art as a tool for social change to say, we're gonna get inside these issues and these students are gonna be able to to be, have critical thinking and share, you know, higher dialogue about this stuff because of how they're, because if you don't reach them in their gut and their emotion, you're not gonna reach them, you know? And I think that that's what has to happen in terms of conversations around education. If you can't get people to react in their gut, if they can't see and see an example of the problem, you know, then they just, if they don't see it, if it doesn't get personal, then they can't get inside the activism around it. And so I'm hoping that the play can get inside our blood, mostly because that story that happened in my play is not is not particularly um, fictional. You know, it happens. It's happened. It's based on things that happened in Detroit, things that I'm sure happening in Cleveland around um, the policing of young people in the public schools. You know, yeah. and um, and I think that that is how I think we can talk about the disparity in education, the decisions that we're making around that in policy. And there's no other way that I think my, my art can assist that conversation than in that play. And it is a play that's on, you know, it's been on PBS. I mean, it's been, you know, it's circulated the nation, but I think I'm excited about the production here after, especially after meeting those artists last night, because I mm -hmm. think that it will, it will jump into your lap. And so I encourage conversation with Cleveland Playhouse, you know, to say, how can we use this play as a, as a jumping off piece to create a forum around education equity? So I, I think that, um, you know, what's interesting, and that's a testament to the power of your work, is that two of the questions that have been asked so far um, have invited you to think about writing about uh, issues of social, social justice that are of such relevance right now. Yeah. And I think that what's implicit in those two questions is the question of how do you choose themes to write about? What is your process in identifying this is a theme and it's relevant enough for me to spend this time unpacking it through um, an hour and a half or two hour long performance? 
<laughs> My bad. I mean, no. I'm, I'm an activist, so many issues move me. I, I, I care about justice. I care about um, obliterating oppression globally. You know, I cannot possibly tell every story of oppression that is not mine to tell. That's right. You know, um, that I don't know somewhat intimately or personally. But I, when I can't sleep at night, you know, pipeline was an issue. The the issue again, reading Michelle Alexander's book. Other writers also helped to get me ignited. Documentaries, you know, other people's stories helped to get me ignited in my own stories. You know. Um, and so I, those things stay with me, and I, I, I find the question that I don't know the answer to, and that's, that's what leads me into writing a play. Because I don't have answers. I'm not giving answers. That's not what I do in my work. I don't even believe in that. And for, for, I don't think that those make the best stories. I think the stories that ask the most questions make the most powerful stories, uh, because it is, it essentially it is asking you to give the answers and not me is asking you to get in conversation with each other. Nobody should leave the play and not have nothing to talk about. I feel like I failed. You know, you should be messed up. I mean, mostly I hope it's the message to sleep up a little bit at night, you know, like it did me when I was writing it, so that it can get us to start talking and figuring this stuff out collectively. Um, yeah. Hi, um, I think my question actually follows up on that. You talked about uh, politics is about people. Mm -hmm. Um, two days ago, I was in the car with my son, and um, there was a survey that came out that said that um, a predominant number of American households, um, parents are not having questions around social justice and race with their children. And my son turned to me and he said, what house do they live in? <laughs> you know, right. how is that possible? And he said, and he's um, 17, he said, race is about people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm going to tell him I asked a noted <laughs> person to comment on the statement he made. Race is about people. Race Could is about people. <sighs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's complicated. I'll say this. I, I, uh, I worked with um, Penn State students, so uh, the director of Pipeline at Cleveland Playhouse, that his name is Steve Broadnax. I worked with him, with his students at Penn State, just like I worked with Justin Emeka and his students at Oberlin, you know, um, who we've grown in these relationships, directorial relationships, where they've taken my work and now doing it at different significant theaters, you know. Um, but at Penn State, we did a play of mine called Blood at the Root, which was inspired by the events of the Gina Six, six young black men in the Gina, Louisiana, who were being tried as adults for uh, um, assaulting a white male student at their school. Prior to that event, the Gina Six, the real life event, several racial things had been going on unchecked at the school, including, and not limited to, there was a tree that, this is real, this is in 2007, a tree at the school that mostly white students sat underneath. And when a, when a black student sat underneath the tree, the next day a noose was hung from that tree. Right? And the school and the administration blew the noose off. It was just a prank. It was a school prank, and let's not, it wasn't about race. And I thought that was a failure of that school, big time. They messed up. As a result, more and more civic unrest happened at that school, and the students, white students and black students, were having a lot of complications and problems at that school for a bunch of administrators that were going, it's not about race. Right, and and then uh, and then it exploded into physical conflict, into so other many things. And so I, when you say race is about people, what happened with those students? When, so when I went to Penn State, I had three black students and three white students, and they were like, "So if you want to write about race, we got a good cast for you." <laughs> and I thought, why would I want to do that? Uh, but then I thought, well, okay, I think I do know what story I want to do. I want to do the Gina Six. And that was in 2013 when I would do that, when we were, when I was like, hey, this thing from 2007 really bothered me. My, mind you, that was before Trayvon Martin had happened. So in 2013, I went to Penn State with a bunch of black and white students, and I'm like, I'm going to make them all the Gina Six. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm going to try to figure this out creatively, you know? And, uh, and what would happen, we would have, get into all these conversations about race. And students, one black male student would get mad at me you know, uh, saying to me, you know, I, I just really didn't know why we had to talk about race and gender and all this kind of stuff today in class. Like, I feel like, you know, I don't have to think about those things. And like, like I'm bringing them up. <laughs> like, like me talking about them is making them happen. You know, 
<laughs> and so, you know, and I asked him, I said, you know, what, what, what other plays were you doing? And I forget what Shakespearean plays they were doing, but you can sort of take your pick. And, um, and let's just say it was, I don't know, King Lear, or, you know, let's say it was Macbeth. You know, and I said, you're, and it was also, they were also doing a Terrell Alvin McCraney play he had done. And I, I looked at him and I said, you're doing those plays and you don't think you're talking about race, gender, and violence? I don't think you know the, the plays you're doing. I don't think you know what's in those plays. That's in Shakespeare, that's in Sorrel Alvin McCraney, and that's in Dominique Marisa. You know? And I saw, if, you don't, if you're up here on this stage with this work and you don't know what's in it, it's like you got a bomb in your hand, you don't know the contents, and you're about to throw it into the laps of the audience. And when that explodes, you're going to have no idea what you just did. You have to be aware and conscious as an artist that race is about people, that everything impacts us, you know. What would end up happening was those students would start getting into arguments, you know, and I was just doing a workshop, so I'd come in, meet them, shake things up, and be like, I'll see you guys in two months. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then I would come back and they were doing more. I have to say, throughout the journey of working on that piece, um, they thought they hated each other. I remember one time one of my white male students was like, I don't have to know anything about my classmates ever again, you know. <laughs> that was a statement he made, you know. Um, post working on this play, so they did the play in South Africa twice. They were invited back. They did the play in Edinburgh. They did the play in uh, uh, Australia. Um, and in New York, they won a Peace Prize for the play in Australia. These students, these three black students and these three white students became um, social activists together. They started a company together. Um, and so, and I remember going to them and I remember saying, I know you hate each other and that's cool, but you gotta listen to each other, you know? And I know you can't bear each other's like ignorances right now. I'm like, this person said this really ignorant thing to you as a black woman and you're like, I'm done, you know? And this person thinks you're so privileged and you're like, well, I'm not privileged because I'm white. I'm like, well, okay, um, but let's, <laughs> you know, let's work that out. You know, let's talk that through, let's think that through a little bit. And, and uh, these students are now, you know, um, the white students are educating other students about white privilege. I mean, like there, it, and I, and this happened because these students uh, bared each other. You know, they took each other's shit, if I will. They could take each other's shit. They could have the hard conversations, the uncomfortable, piss me off conversations, and get to something on the other side of it and find their action in it. You know, and I think that for me, when I when it takes down to the races about people, to me, what that means is that we have to be willing to hear and piss each other off a little bit and bear it. And I think that's what college is all about. But you have to be willing to like bear each other so that we can say, you know, I, I won't learn if I shut off and just stop listening. But you also have to know when you bear the privilege in the room, it's your job to be the listener. You know, when you bear the privilege, it's your job to be the listener. And privilege is some uncomfortable shit. Mm -hmm. I've, I experience privilege in Haiti because I have so-called first world privilege. I have economic privilege. I have light skin privilege. That's also something people don't talk about, oh. you know? And, and, and light skin privilege is very real. And it's an uncomfortable conversation within communities of color, you know? But if I can bear my privilege, Privilege doesn't mean that you, you know, like it or that you luxuriate in it, but you, it means you have it. And so then if you figure out that you have privilege, whatever that privilege is, then you can learn how to use it, use it to liberate other people. Hello, my, my name is Darius. I'm a, a performer and an activist here in the city. Um, I, I, I have two questions that are sort of linked. Um, given um, the fact that your work uh, sort of um, puts a, a lens on the concept of justice and how that manifests itself or not, um, and given the, the venues where your work is currently being shown or going to be shown here in the city, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, I, I'm curious about what you would, who you would say your work is for, and um, how, what, and also, what is your feeling about accessibility when it comes to the theater? That's an excellent question, thank you for that. That's part of my mission as an artist, I wanna talk about that, because that's where I think mostly um, the theater industry that I love, that is where I have feel failed the most. Uh, because theater for me, I believe in democracy in the nation, so I have to believe in it in theater. 
And where I don't see examples of that democracy is in audience development. And um, so that means that I don't see economic justice in the theater. I don't see uh, the people that look like the people on stage in the house. That feels like some very antiquated, mm. you know, mm. some, some 1949, you had a jazz club and you got to go in the back door business, mm. you know? That feels like what segregation looked like. And so where well, you have black performers on stage and not in the audience. Mm. And, and so I, I think that that's not an easy problem to, to fix. So I, 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 I give theaters credit for constantly talking about it and thinking about it. But I think if you're going to really be um, make action happen around it, you've got to listen to the experts from those communities. And that's where I'm not seeing a lot of change happen. I'm not seeing the people behind in the producing model. I'm not seeing the marketing people look like the people that you're marketing to. And I think that that's problematic. So whether that means you expand your marketing budget, whether you have marketing specialists from different communities, which would be, to me, the most valuable thing. I also think theater struggles with budget in general. <laughs> I am learning. I'm learning about theaters. You know, I'm on the board of two now, um, but Detroit Public Theater and Signature Theater in New York. And, and I'm basically there to learn about, like, so what, how, how do you get money? How does that happen? <laughs> does theater have any money at all? <laughs> um, and by and large, everybody's like, no, we're struggling, oh, God. You know, we didn't know how we were going to be open this year. You know? <laughs> and so I'm just like, how is this? How are we going to keep this going? I think part of how you keep it going, and this is what I would love everybody to, like, really find a holistic ways of dealing with. You cannot keep theater going if you are keeping young people and people of color out. Oh, it will die, and it will die hard. It will die just like this regime is going to die hard. It's going to die so hard, you know, if we don't engage young people in the theater. And I think that that's, that is across the board. I have seen ageism really big time with, um, with how, who we're listening to and how we're listening and how we're, how we're engaging that community. And that means we gotta take some of their bad habits with them. You know what I mean? We have to take some of the habits of the youth. You know, we are gonna have to change the model. Like if, if texting is the thing, we can't be like, well, you know, I don't like the way they're speaking. I'm like, oh, we gonna have to, uh, sometimes we have to learn to speak in abbreviations because that's the chosen language of those people. And you can't go to a people and, to, and tell them don't have the language that they had. They created that language. Mm. That is not, that's, that's not an inferior language, it's a new language. And you have to speak the language of the people that you love. And that is what I had learned. Um, that's what an activist told me. Kevin Powell wrote that in his book. Um, I forget which book, he has a lot of them. But he wrote, <laughs> you know, to love a people is to learn their language. And when I went to Haiti, I'm a Haitian who does not speak Creole. Trust me, I had my lessons. And I took my private lessons and I'm speaking my bad Creole to the people that I love. Because I cannot communicate with you if I tell you that you are inferior because I won't speak in your tongue. I won't use your pronoun. I won't speak the way you want me to speak about you. I'm dismissing your humanity. So to love a people is to learn the language. And so um, that is what I think that theater needs to be doing. Learn the language of uh, of everyone. That doesn't mean you, again, I don't believe in displacement. So I think, you know, we have this fear mongering thing in our country that it trickles down into every institution. That, you know, to include means to replace. Mm. That doesn't mean that. You know, circles are very, they work like this. If you think of a circle and not a linear society, but a circular one, you know, circles get bigger because people just step back and make room, you know? Lines mean I got to step on you and replace you and get to the top. So let's get out of a linear society. Let's get into a circular society and just step back, and make room for more, you know? And I think that we can do that in the theater, but it will take um, engaging younger artists, new artists, artists of color. It will take engaging um, different identity, gender identity artists. It will take engaging people that don't look, think, or talk like us to say, you matter too. Where are you in this space? And where are you out there? Because it can't be up here. And it, this up here is not enough. This is good. We have to have diversity here and there. And I don't think we're achieving that globally in theater. And definitely not nationally. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm 
name's Grace. Um, speaking of including young people in theater, I'm uh, the Curriculum and Academy Apprentice with Cleveland Playhouse. So um, pretty much everyone in the apprentice program is you know, either just out of college or just out of grad school and like transitioning into the professional arts realm. And we have these wonderful opportunities to hear from professionals in our field and in our area and get to come to events like this, which is amazing. And what I always like to ask is, what were you doing when you were fresh out of college or fresh out of grad school? Like, how did you get to be where you are? Um, because we hear a lot of the end goal and then we feel like we're not doing enough or we're doing the wrong thing and it's hard to access that. So how did, how did you get to be here? What was the moment? <laughs> There's no wrong thing. Every, it's like, I look at life like it's GPS. If I went right and they wanted me to go left, it's just gonna reroute me. <laughs> I'm still getting to the end goal. I'm, I'm still getting to the end, you know? And so, uh, and I do want to instill that in young people. There's no bad choice. You're not making bad choices with your life. You're making choices that are going to lead you to the next thing, right? So if you made a mistake in your, that meant that you did something that didn't seem in alignment with what you want to do, then you have to learn from that thing and keep moving. So that's not actually a problem, you know? It's just about how you take information in. So to me, the thing that I did, the thing that I did was do a lot of things, <laughs> you know? I'm, I, I just made a mess everywhere I went, and I loved it. You know, I, 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 I taught, you know, I taught for a year and saved all my money. I moved to New York. I can give you the very fast 10-step program. I moved to New York. Um, I, I was poor for a year, ate ramen noodles and peanut butter jelly sandwiches and had a roommate. We did nothing but make fake movies in our house with a really bad video camera. We didn't have like these phones that could do it all now on your phone. And um, you know, that would be embarrassed if those got out and somebody has that footage. But, <laughs> but hopefully it's just me. But, um, but you know, we, I, we, I played around. I started a theater company with some of my friends. I joined an educational theater company. The people that I met at that theater company, we went on to build our own company sometimes together. We we, we, I had a company that failed. We didn't do nothing. I put on a one-woman show. It was awful. I'll never do it again. I did a lot of things, you know? I got on stage. I tried my hand at this. I did spoken word. I did open mics. I did slam poetry. Well, I did a lot of things. I did a dance show when I first moved to New York. I'm not a dancer. <laughs> but I was in a dance show when I went to New York City because that was my first gig, you know? And um, eventually, uh, I'll say this. I worked at... I worked at Creative Arts team and there I met a lot of people and we had a lot of ideas. So while we were working at this job, we were doing other things. So um, one of the people that I met there was a friend of mine, his name, her name is uh, Camila Forbes. She had the Hip Hop Theater Festival in New York City, Camila Forbes. Camila, I was like, man, I really like you, I really like what you're doing, I wanna work with you. She started, you know, I wrote some plays, I was like, could you direct them, could we do some things? Now, that was maybe in 20, 2003, 2004. Camila is now the executive director of the Apollo Theater in New York City. That's my friend. She's directing my play next year in New York. We stay connected. I had another friend, me and him, taught out in the school, out in the schools. Um, his name was Ben Snyder. We, he, he and I taught out in the schools. We started a theater company. We did a lot of things. Um, he and I are now working on a television series together in New York City, and he's the head of writing of the film department at Brooklyn College, right? Um, another friend of mine, he and I taught in the schools, and uh, we, taught, we taught little kids, we taught children, we were teaching them literacy to life, so we were bringing books to life. Um, he uh, had this musical that he was working on at the time called In the Heights, I didn't really know that. <laughs> We were like talking about our plays and I didn't know what he was creating. Um, but you know, we were, he gave me some like writing advice on you know, writer's block. Again, several years later, he's Lin-Manuel Miranda, blah, 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 Hamilton. And so then, you know, and so I mean, what, so the most valuable thing that I did, and I do want to say this to you, is I built with the people around me. I built with the people that were right around me. I didn't look for the person that already had everything that I wanted and said, give me some, please. I said, what did you have? How did you get it? And then I turned to the people next to me <laughs> and said, let's do this, let's build this. So when I finally, in 2010, got my first, um, I joined the Public Emerging Writers Group. That was after 10 years of being in New York City. Nine, it was like after nine years of being in New York City, I finally got recognized in this program that was treating me as an emerging writer. I've been in New York City for 10 years. <laughs> And it was like, and now you are an emerging playwright. And that theater produced my first play in New York, Detroit 67, right? From there is blah, 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 MacArthur. And so, <laughs> I just want you to know, 
I just want you to know, like, it starts from the building blocks. It doesn't even matter if at tomorrow, if nobody else wanted to produce another play of mine, and when the shiny dress that I'm in wears off and the new color is green, you know, then I will have about 20 years of foundation of people that will rock with me because we built together. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I would say about that. I love what a clear and straight path that was. <laughs> Remarkable. <laughs> I'm Dan Walther, Chief Executive here. We're closing it out, sadly. We could listen to this for another hour or two. Um, and it's been a wonderful forum with playwright in 2018 MacArthur Fellow, Dominique Marceau. She's been in conversation with Daniel Gray Contar, the Executive Artistic Director at 12 Literary Arts, and of course also in conversation with all of you. Ms. Morso appears as part of our Disruptor series, which is sponsored by Bank of America. We're delighted to have Jennifer Hurd and her colleagues and guests with us today. We appreciate your continued support of City Club programming. Ms. Morso is also here as part of our Authors in Conversation series, which is supported in part by you, the residents of Cuyahoga County, through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Thank you all, you residents of Cuyahoga County, for your generous support through that public grant. Our community partners today are Cleveland Playhouse, Cleveland Public Theater, Dobama Theater, and Caramu House. Thank you so much for your partnership in promoting today's forum. And additionally, we welcome guests at a table hosted by Cuyahoga Community College. We're happy to have all of you with us today. That brings us to the end. Thank you, Ms. Morso, Mr. Greg Contar. Special thanks to City Club members who make this forum and all forums possible. To find out more about upcoming forums and how you can support City Club, visit us online at cityclub.org. Our forum is adjourned. Have a great day. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of